Micha Sifri, author of the new book, WikiLeaks and the Age of Transparency. Micha Sifri is the co-founder and curator of the Personal Democracy Forum, editor of its award-winning techpresident.com blog, and a senior technolo technology advisor to the Sunlight Foundation. He has uh, written a number of books and is a member of the board of the Consumers Union, also the adjunct professor uh, at the Political Science Department at the City University of New York Graduate Center, where he teaches a course called Writing Politics. Please welcome Mika Sifri to our stage. Hi. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Kate. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's great to be here. It's always fun to be at Google. Um, and I kind of was thinking uh, as, as I headed down here that uh, it was particularly right to be talking about this book at Google, given Google's own mission um, to organize all the world's information and, and make it universally accessible. Um, I think the, the, the topic of transparency ought to be and probably is uh, quite close to the hearts of, of lots of people who, who support that mission. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, we'll get a chance to, to um, sort of engage in a little bit of a dialogue about how you think about WikiLeaks and how you think about the larger transparency movement as it relates also to what Google does. Because um, I think, uh, um, you know, we, we live in, in, in a rapidly changing world and a big piece of that change is, is uh, uh, being fostered at places like this. Um, I'm going to start by actually talking about just two quick episodes that have nothing to do with WikiLeaks. Um, and just to say, I wrote this book uh, very quickly. It's not a big book. It's a little book. It's meant to be, uh, in, in, in some ways, a connect, a connect the dots kind of book. Uh, because what I, when WikiLeaks happened, I thought, well, all this attention is going to Julian Assange and Bradley Manning, and there are all kinds of important questions raised by uh, what they've done. But um, there's a danger that you know our media will just obsess on you know the the celebrity aspect of this and miss the larger picture. And the larger picture is that what WikiLeaks represents is a symptom of a of a, a larger trend. Um, and if Julian Assange and WikiLeaks didn't exist, um, sooner or later, somebody would have done this. The technology to do this, build a stateless platform or multi-state platform that's relatively free from state intervention to enable whistleblowers to post internal documents, that this has been coming. Um, and I suspect a year from now, we may not be talking about Julian Assange anymore, but we will certainly be talking about this larger phenomenon of user-generated transparency. Um, so I wanted to just start by, by, with two quick episodes. The first one is, uh, is there anybody here from Croatia? OK, so you've probably not heard of this story. Um, so uh, one of the people I, I profile in the book in the section about the international transparency movement is a guy named Marco Rekar who um, several years ago, he had a printing business um, and uh, a, a tax auditor came to him and basically demanded a bribe uh, in order to get a clean tax bill. And Marco refused to pay the bribe and as a result, this guy basically hounded, his, hounded him out of business, drove his printing business into bankruptcy. And this was early in the days of blogging and he decided to start a blog called Politica, which is sort of like the Daily Coast uh, is. It's one of these sites where you have, uh, anybody can create an account and um, participate, not just the blogger who started it. And it's evolved into the leading political blog in Croatia, country of about uh, eight, seven, eight million people. Um, it's probably got, uh, you know, five or 6,000 core contributors. Um, and you know it's one of the top red sites in the country. Um, and Marco is is uh, part of a generation of people in Croatia who are trying to move that country from being very much an authoritarian system to something that's more open and democratic. Um, two years ago, somebody leaked him 
a database of the entire uh, voter file for Croatia. Um, Croatia has this weird circumstance, which is that it has more registered voters than it has citizens. Um, and it, 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 that's partly a, a relic of uh, being part of Yugoslavia and that, you know, people, you know, the boundaries of Croatia include people who like probably lived across the road from where the boundary was put, okay? But uh, the fact is, is that they don't police registration very well and there's a ton of corruption around voter registration because if you're, uh, well, first of all, you get some, some benefits uh, but more importantly, local officials use it to cement their power. So he got this database, and he um, had the uh, wisdom to put it online in a searchable way so that you could look up any village and any address and see how many people were registered to vote at that address. And people started swarming into this on his site and discovered towns where like, there'd be an address like uh, you know, the town of Ducina, there'd be an address, the equivalent of zero Broadway, okay? And it has 400 people registered at it, okay? And what was quickly exposed is the fact that local mayors or local police were letting people register at fake addresses, using their votes to stay in office in local elections, right? So this is about keeping local power structures intact. Um, by posting this database, Marco set off a firestorm in the country. It was top headlines in every paper, on the evening news, and it set off uh, a debate which is now culminating in a constitutional change that will prevent it, anyone from being registered to vote in more than one country. <laughs> right? You're in Croatia, you can only be registered to vote in Croatia. Um, so they're starting to fix their, their process. More recently, um, I need to be careful about how I describe this. Somebody posted a database, and this one was not posted in, in Croatia, it was posted in the United States, but in Croatian, of all, the of all the veterans in Croatia receiving veterans benefits, okay? Um, and there were something like 500,000 names on the list. And to be a, a veteran means you get like subsidized health care, you, uh, you can buy imports without paying high tariffs, uh, you get cheap loans to buy a house. It, there were more than 500,000 names on the list. The problem is, is that when the war, when the Balkan War ended, there were only 300,000 veterans. The ruling party had been adding names to the list of whoever they wanted to do a favor for. And so they discovered when this list was posted that there were politicians who had maybe, quote, served a week uh, who were being listed as veterans and getting these benefits. Um, when this happened, Marco was arrested. He was briefly held uh, by the police. They searched all his computers. Uh, they couldn't find anything, luckily for him. Um, and if you say to Marco, well, uh, nobody, you know, if you ask him who leaked the, C, the, the state, he says, you know, nobody knows. If you say to him, well, nobody really knows how the data was leaked. He'll say, well, actually, it was on CDs um, with a wink, OK? I, I think of Marco as a data transparency revolutionary. Um, and I think there are lots of people like him around the world. But I think it's important to ask a, a question about him. So the second database, the one with the veterans benefits, that was posted on servers in the United States. It actually like, was hit millions of times in the first few weeks uh, that it came out. The demand from inside Croatia was so big. But what if, I don't know, let's say uh, Croatia was like a really close ally of the United States and some senator you know, called on the company that was hosting the servers to take it down because it was stolen material, right? And then that company took it down kick them off their servers. What would we think? Um, the second story I want to tell you is about um, the problem of, I guess, I guess I would call this the problem of illegitimate secrecy, <laughs> of when governments try to hide information that citizens know should also be let loose into the world to uh, expose and, and deal with corruption. Um, 
It's the case of the, the British uh, Parliament uh, expense records. People familiar with this story? Um, I mean, for years, uh, a couple of journalists have been like foying the British Parliament to release the expense records. And they've been just, you know, deny, 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 drag their feet. Um, after about five years, the, the Parliament, and, and exposure in other ways, the Parliament finally set up a committee uh, to start to release the records. Um, what they were really doing is they set up an internal secret redaction unit to clean up the records before they were released so nothing embarrassing would come out. So uh, in May of 2009, The Telegraph, the British newspaper The Telegraph, actually started publishing the unexpurgated records. And they were leaked to them by a, a guy named John Wick, who was a former SAS officer, who was actually the intermediary for an anonymous source. We don't know who that person was. We believe it's somebody who was actually on the staff of this redac redaction unit. Um, and Heather Brook, who was the journalist who was doing all these FOIA requ requests, writes about this. She says, some of the people on the staff of that unit were so disgusted by what they saw and by the lies being told about the delays in releasing the information that they made a copy of the data, a mole inside the redaction room made a copy, later passed it to John Wick. Wick says that he also was told that critical information was being removed from the files that would prevent many of the expense scandals from being revealed. And he said to the, to the Telegraph at the time, quote, the ultimate source was adamant that the key thing was that both the information and the way in which it was handled should be in the public domain and that its release was in the public interest. Wick also told the press he was personally dismayed at how much information the government was collecting on the public and how poorly it was keeping that information private, saying, we've reached the stage in society where they want to know everything about us. I think we're no entitled to know about them. Now, as a result of this leak, again, it set off a huge bipartisan or tripartisan uh, political scandal in England. Uh, various people lost their jobs, including the Speaker of, of the Parliament, who's more of a functionary than he is a political figure, but he was covering everybody else's asses. Um, it also put, lit a fire under the open data movement in British government, and it's why a guy like Tim Berners-Lee has actually been able to get in and work with both first the Labor government and now more recently the Conservative government on all the open data stuff that the Brits have been doing, which is actually uh, at least as good, if not better, than what uh, the Obama administration has been doing. So here's a case where a leak by a conscientious insider uh, has really um, had dramatically positive effects, even though it was extremely disruptive and embarrassing um, to people in power. So. I, I wanted to open with both of those stories because I think they uh, point to the larger promise of the transparency movement, um, which I think is both a top-down and a bottom-up uh, kind of thing. Um, the top-down is from enlightened insiders who recognize the power of open data and open information to make institutions work better and to enable us the citizens to do things together and with government to make uh, the, civ the whole civic sector work better. Um, and it's also going to happen from the bottom up, from people doing it to the powers that be. Um, how many people here know why Bradley Manning said he uh, leaked the stuff that he leaked, assuming he did indeed do it to give it to WikiLeaks, which is alleged at this point, right? Anybody here know what, he, what the reasons are? So all we have right now are the chat logs that Adrian Lamo uh, leaked to Wired magazine and which uh, have been posted. But in those, um, and we also have the back and forth between uh, Bradley Manning and his lawyer. Uh, and he has one friend who's been allowed to visit him in prison. So there's been little bits of data that have come out from that. And so far, there's been nothing to contradict uh, what's in those chat logs. And in the chat logs, what he says is he was serving in Iraq on a, on a military base, um, and he was given the assignment. Uh, he was in a intel low-level intelligence job. And he was given the assignment 
of looking into the case of 15 Iraqi insurgents who had been arrested by the Iraqi National Police. Um, and what he discovered, he says, is that they had been distributing a leaflet critical of the Prime Minister, Maliki. And the leaflet essentially, after he got it translated, was titled something like, where did the money go? It was an anti-corruption pamphlet, and it was dealing with publicly available information, raising questions about corruption inside the government. And uh, he got upset because he thought that we were in Iraq to actually uh, help them develop a real democracy, including one that would ferret out corruption and wouldn't arrest people for spreading that information. And um, so he went to his superior and his superior told him to shut up, do his job, and if anything, find ways to help the Iraqi police arrest more people like this. That's when he says he had an epiphany or a crisis of conscience. I mean, his word, I'm not using his exact words. I, I did quote some of them in the book. But he says at that point, he started seeing things differently. Um, now, I'm not going to say whether or not it, it was the right thing for him to leak everything or, you know, take a huge data dump. Or, you know, we could debate that, I suppose. But I, I do really want people to understand, at heart, what Bradley Manning is, is a transparency activist. OK? Um, and right now, he has been in a US prison, a military prison in Virginia, going on nine months, more or less solitary confinement. The latest uh, thing they've come up with is to make him strip naked every night and show up each morning in front of his cell naked because he apparently joked about the possibility that he could use the elastic band in his underwear to cause himself harm. Um, that's happening right now in our country. And I think he deserves his day in court. He may well have to spend a long time in jail for violating the military code. But you know, don't we have a system here, rule of law, people are supposed to get charged at some point and have a chance to defend themselves. It's been nine months. So uh, that's it. That's my opening remarks. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, or just dive into the questions that are here. How do you want to do this? Come to the mic. I, I really believe that, that the people in the room should get precedence over the folks here, unless you're one of the people who asked one of these questions. And, uh, but since there don't seem to be that many votes on the questions anyway, unless you have to refresh the page, you want to put them up on the screen behind so people can see? Go ahead. Isn't openness in power, isn't openness always a threat to those in power? I mean, even like policemen, they're arresting people on wiretap for, for um, recording the fact that they've stopped them and they've, they've said outrageous things to them. Um, you know, what can we do to make it so that that you know, low-level flunkies even can use closeness to keep themselves from getting in trouble for, being, for breaking the law. Well, I, look, I, I mean, I think what's interesting about the time that we live in is that the ability to share uh, information that, that matters is now in everybody's hands. Um, you know, we're only a few years into this phenomenon of everyone carrying a, a networked printing press in their pocket. Um, so. The, the old way of doing things, which is still dominant, which is about control of information and secrecy and lack of accountability, is being fundamentally threatened. Um, I mean, what Google does is fundamentally threatening to the ability of people to, uh, you know, to lie in your face, right? Because if, if I'm talking to my member of Congress at a, in a public hearing and they a public event or something, and they say something, and I'm like, that's exactly the opposite of what you said two years ago. I can actually look it up, pull it up, play it back to them. Um, what what happens after that? Right, that's the moment that we're in now. Um, and my argument is is that we're we're in a, like a paradigm shift. It's going to be messy and upsetting to the people in power, and they're going to say things like. You can't have that information. You stole it, <laughs> right? Um, but we now have it. Uh, and not every, in not every case because somebody leaked it either, right? It's just because it's been well organized and put at our fingertips. 
Um, and I think that's going to be really, really disruptive to the current generation and profoundly positive for the next generation. Because I also think we're going to get new leaders, we're going to get new folks in all kinds of positions of authority who are going to go, well, I actually can do a better job if I'm open. My, my constituency, my audience, my patients, you know, whoever the people are that I work with, um, my community that I'm supposed to protect and serve can actually make me smarter and better at what I do, right? They can be eyes and ears too. So the, the issue is uh, we have to spread that idea. We have, to, we have to advocate for it. We have to explain to people not to be scared. I mean, a, a lot of the reason why I wrote this book is not to educate folks in this room. I think you guys live and breathe this in many ways. You take it for granted. Um, but it's for you to be able to say to your you know, family, what, why, what, what is all this stuff and why is it so good or bad? You know, a lot of people are scared by this big change that we're living through or they just don't get it. They don't see how the pieces connect up. And so they're saying things like with WikiLeaks coming out, they were like, well, I, I, it would be terrible if my, all my emails were published or if you know, every business transaction that I ever do was splashed across the web. And I think it's important to say to people, well, the issue about user-generated transparency making its way into the public arena is that a lot of it is not going to be about your laundry list or your shopping list. It's going to be about some powerful figure or some powerful institution. The more powerful, the more the transparency matters. The less powerful, I'd argue, we, we need to worry about if people with little power, how do we help protect legitimately their privacy, right? That's a tricky balance. Um, and sometimes when somebody goes from having very little power to having a lot, all of a sudden, like wait, Julian Assange, I think, ought to be acting in a much more transparent way than he is. And a lot of the reason why I think he's lost credibility is because of the way he behaves. He is, to even the people in his own core group, much too controlling, much too authoritarian, much too arbitrary about his decisions. And that's why WikiLeaks itself, as an organization, is some, somewhat falling apart. Other questions? Yeah. What do you think about uh, Bill Keller's um, actions and the New York Times actions with regards to WikiLeaks uh, recently? Um, and how, you know, with the expose and basically them dropping a lot of the WikiLeaks content? Yeah. Oh well, I'm uh, you know I'm glad the New York Times decided to participate and and you know is publishing some stories. I think it's a really good question because of the role the New York Times plays in the American media system um, to sort of focus a little more closely on what they are and not what they are doing and what they're not doing. Um, people may not realize, but the New York Times has the entire State Department archive. Uh, so does The Guardian. Um, it's not just WikiLeaks anymore. I don't know. There may be others. I think there's a paper in Norway that claims to have the whole thing. So when the New York Times doesn't do a story, like right now, for example, Reuters had a story recently going into detail on corruption in Saudi Arabia. There's a cable from 1996, which hasn't been released, that they refer to that specifically describes how the Saudi royal family uh, sort of spreads the patronage around. Now, you might say, if you're the editor of the New York Times, Bill Keller, that there's no news in that cable because we already know that there's a lot of you know, patronage and, and corruption. But the fact that the State Department, you know, that an, uh, uh, an ambassador put it in writing and there's detail and there are names, to me, that's news. Why are they holding back on that cable? Um, and the only plausible answer you can give is that the New York Times is too close to the US government. Um, and that we have put a little bit too much power in the hands of the Times editor's judgment. They have admitted, I mean, I've talked to David Sanger, who's uh, their chief Washington correspondent. I've been on panels with him. That they did not know the importance of the cables on Tunisia. They have admitted that when they got their hands on the full cable set, that no one 
could possibly read 250,000 cables. So what did they do? They searched on keywords. Um, they, you know, they did enterprise journalism the way you would, which is, you know, they let different reporters who know different beats sort of look for patterns. But they've never read them all. Um, no one has. <laughs> which astounds me because it, it's, you know, that, that could be the Rosetta Stone in some ways or a partial Rosetta Stone to unraveling how the world has been run for the last 10 or 15 years. And, um, you know, I think we would agree that a lot of that information, yeah, sure, redact out the names of individuals who might be harmed because they're human rights activists or they're informants and you need to protect them. But all the other stuff, why are they holding it back? Now, they say they send, every time they do a story, they check with the State Department, which is effectively saying, we check with the government um, and then we'll hold some things back. Uh, um, I mean, I think, you know, there ought to be a demand put to the Times or, you know, we, I mean, I've talked to a few people. It's just a matter of figuring out whether there's a way to press this uh, more forcefully um, to open up that archive. Uh, you know, or open it up responsibly, like turn it into something that, you know, people can check in and do research and check out or, you know, I'm not saying dump the whole thing on the web indiscriminately. So I, I think there are real questions about the times. Um, on the other hand, I thought Bill Keller was eloquent in defending the principle of the freedom of the press to publish this. And he has sort of reluctantly said that, yeah, you know, he would even defend Julian Assange's right to publish. I mean, it's, it's kind of gross the way uh, Keller kind of wants to treat Assange as this, you know, he's, he, I mean, I, you know, he, he really has gone out of his way. You know, he smells, he doesn't wash. I mean, to, to point those things out is, is a real form of, he's not one of us. We're, we're responsible and he's not. And, you know, there are plenty of investigative journalists who are not pleasant people. I don't know if you know any. They, they tend to be really driven, uh, somewhat secretive, pain in the asses. I've edited a few of them over the years. And, but they're the ones who you know, often do the digging to expose the stuff that needs to be exposed. Um, and I just thought Keller, at one point, he did this event at Columbia and he said uh, something about how Assange changed his mind about redacting information after Amnesty International complained. And, and Keller said, and I'm sure Assange, you know, his constituency probably leans more to the Amnesty International crowd. And that was an offense. I mean, it's like, why does Bill Keller think he has to insult Amnesty International? They do incredibly vital work on behalf of political, you know, I mean, who else does it, <laughs> you know? And they just write letters to, you know, governments to get them to treat their political prisoners slightly better. So very troubling. New York Times, it's a very powerful and not very transparent institution that uh, I think we have to pay close attention to and try and get them to open up on this side. So your opening stories were very fascinating. And the one about the Croatian blogger, mm. you asked at the end the question whether what would we think if the U.S. government shut down his website that is currently hosted in the U.S. Right. And I don't know the answer, but I was thinking about it. So instead of giving the answer that I don't know, I ask you a similar question. Okay. And a similar story. The, uh, my native country is Hungary, so I, I still follow politics there. And uh, there, there was, there is, uh, infamous website, extremely anti-Semitic website. And it was so extreme that even the Hungarian government found it too extreme. Mm. And uh, it was sued and eventually they shut it down. So it, among other things, it listed uh, every journalist who was Jewish, his home, home address and phone number. Mm -hmm. They were very careful not to say, hey, go and kill them, right? Because this would be hate speech. Right. Only a list, objective list, information. So what they did after they shut down, 
they moved the web server to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is the end of the story. So right now they operate it from New Jersey. And so what do you think we should do? It's a good question. <laughs> so in general, um, it's a great hard question. Um, so my, my personal feeling is uh, that we don't want to create a system of, of you know, shutting down speech, uh, as long as it's speech, OK? Um, and so the question is, if it's direct incitement to violence or not. Um, and I would err very much on in the direction of leave it up as long as it is not direct incitement to violence and take other measures to protect people if they need to be protected. The, the thing about posting people's personal information, it's offensive to do it. Um, but if you create a system that says it can't, you know, in other words, that, that polices and can shut places down simply for posting somebody's personal information. What I worry is how that's going to get used when it's not something as offensive as the kind of speech you're talking about, but it's just critical of somebody in power. Okay? Um, and, you know, like there was a recent. Uh, uh, this came up about a year or two ago. Uh, uh, Michael Arrington at, Face, uh, at TechCrunch went after Facebook for leaving up groups that uh, deny the Holocaust, right? Um, and Facebook, you know, it's a messy situation because they also don't have the manpower to like monitor every new group as soon as it's put up. So you know, these groups get onto the site and people join them. Um, and, you know, so some people were just hammering at Facebook for allowing Holocaust deniers to create groups on the site. And, you know, Facebook's policy is as long as these groups are not directly advocating violence against others, we're going to let them exist. It's speech. Um, and you know we have a tradition of allowing robust free speech in the United States, uh, and that we generally believe the way to combat bad speech isn't by suppressing it, but by with better speech, with more speech. Um, personally, I think it's kind of a good thing if you you know if this happens on Facebook, because even there, if they're enforcing their rules about you know people having to use their real name and picture, you can kind of go on these groups and go. That person's a Holocaust denier. You know, I mean, he's made himself public in a way. Um, we're not going to get rid of Holocaust denial by hiding it. We're not going to get rid of anti-Semitism by suppressing it. We have to, you know, we have to deal with it. The way you deal with it is by exposing it and arguing with it and marginalizing it. That, that's my view. The place where it crosses over is, are people using these sites to organize acts of violence against other people? That's where law, you know, other laws come into play. I don't know if that's a perfect answer. I mean, you're asking, like, absolutely one of the hardest edge questions. And it's the one where those of us who are civil libertarians about speech run into trouble. You know, the ACLU defended the right of the Nazis to march in a Jewish neighborhood in, in Skokie, Illinois. And they lost like a quarter of their members, who were Jewish, probably, who were so offended by that. But you know, the point of free speech is we have to protect unpopular speech. I mean, my argument about defending WikiLeaks in part is that it's not that I endorse every single thing that they do. I just don't like the idea that a, a, all it takes is a, a threatening phone call from Joe Lieberman's Senate office to somebody at Amazon for Amazon to completely cave in and, and kick WikiLeaks off their servers. There's no criminal case. And it's not like WikiLeaks is posting copyrighted material, which was another one of the reasons that Amazon gave for kicking Weeks, WikiLeaks off their servers. You can't copyright government documents. They're born uncopyrighted. 
okay? So, you know, Amazon's reasons were just completely bogus. And, you know, they used to say that you should put your stuff in the cloud because that's, a, you know, it'll be more secure there. Well, now you have to worry whether the company that's hosting your stuff in their cloud is going to, you know, uh, crumble under the tiniest bit of government pressure. I, I mean, I have to say, I, I was very happy that, you know, when the question was posed to Eric Schmidt, what did you guys think about, you know, indexing links to WikiLeaks uh, disclosures? He says, yeah, we had a conversation about it, and we decided to keep doing it because it's legal. Like, that's the right answer. Later, you can, you know, well, if there's a criminal case, and fine, we'll abide by the law. But nothing, none, none of that's happened. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you think the, uh, the way they're treating private Manning is more to get him to implicate Assange as a co-conspirator, or is it more to have a chilling effect on any potential, like, future whistleblowers, and do you think it will achieve either one of those? It's definitely to, to intimidate other potential whistleblowers. I think they really want to send a message to other people in the Army um, that, you know, this is worse than, you know, torturing people in Abu Ghraib. You know, we're going we're gonna to treat you worse. I mean, I think it's despicable, but that's their, you know, they, they, this is about enforcing the chain of command. Um, and, you know, the fact that General Petraeus could leak his highly classified proposal for expanding the war in Afghanistan to Bob Woodward, which then made front page news in the Washington Post and was used to undermine Obama's own planning process, right? Like nobody's uh, prosecuting him or, or putting him in solitary. Um, so they're definitely trying to send a message. I mean, there's a theory that they're also trying to break him and, and um, somehow get him to implicate uh, WikiLeaks. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know whether they're, they're that willful or it's more just this is the military discipline system. I mean, you know, I, I recently wrote a blog post where I said, you know, I, I mean, if this is meant to be mental torture, What's so troubling about it is what it, it could do is that at the point at which he does finally get his day in court, he won't be sane. Um, he won't be able to help pr present his own case. Uh, and that would be a tragedy. Um, I mean, let him make his case. He may not win. You know, a, a military jury or judge may not buy a Nuremberg defense if that's what he's going to argue. You know, he can argue that. He can say uh, that soldiers are required to report uh, war crimes under the Nuremberg uh, precedents, which are supposed to govern. And that's all I, you know, he can say, that's what I thought I was doing. But they're accusing him of aiding the enemy. That's a pretty serious charge. So, yeah. Uh, Joe, pardon me for a bit of a tangent. Um, you decided to uh, write a relatively short book quickly. Yeah. Um, I, could you comment on sort of how viable this is as a publishing strategy and uh, whether you think it's really um, economically worthwhile to put it on paper? Great, great, great questions. You can also ask uh, my editor and publisher, John Oakes, over there uh, after we're done, because I'm sure he believes it's economically viable. Um, so th the answer is, uh, I'm intrigued by this possibility of, you know, the sort of shorter, quicker, time, you know, the timeliness of, of a book. It's very frustrating as an author to write a book and then have to wait nine months, you know, for it to come out. And by then, you're already out of date. Um, so when John came to me in the middle of December and started to sort of woo me into doing this, um, one of the reasons why I thought, yeah, maybe I could do it is because he said it just had to be like 25,000 words. And on a good day, I can write three or 4,000 words if I'm in, in the right groove. So I thought, ah, I mean, you know, I could do this in a week. Well, it ended up taking three weeks, and it was like 45,000 words. But, um, and then getting it out fast is the, the second thing that's very gratifying. Um, does it make sense to still be on paper? Well, I'm in the middle of trying to learn, you know, 
the pluses and minuses of ebooks myself. I mean, I do both now, right? Um, and I love the immediacy of getting that ebook, right? Um, and it works for me with fiction because I really read linearly in fiction. But I'm noticing, like, I, I also have downloaded all the other WikiLeaks books, and I'm finding it really annoying that I can't, you know, sort of go to an index or, you know, jump to somewhere in the middle. I mean, when I pick up a physical book, I, I you know, I go like this. I, I, you know, there's a certain element of just, you know, find where you're mentioned, <laughs> you know, whatever, which I guess you could do with search on, on an ebook. But it, it, there's something about the utility of the paper uh, that I like um, that so far, at least on the Kindle platform, which is what I'm using, doesn't quite do it. Um, on the other hand, what I'm really, really intrigued by, we're going to actually do, hopefully, right? Um, we're we're going to turn the book into an app. And we're going to add a couple of features to it, um, basically three. Uh, one is there are about 15 places in the book where somebody uh, who I'm quoting actually has spoken at one of our Personal Democracy Forum conferences. Um, so we have video. Um, and you know, we actually have done a series of WikiLeaks-related events over the last few months. So we actually have short video of people like Jeff Jarvis and so on you know, saying really smart things that if you're like really into the subject, having that video right there might make it a richer reading experience for you or a teaching experience. Um, so I'm really intrigued by adding that. We're going to add, because there are about 40 or 50 websites mentioned in the book, we're going to add sort of links to screenshots. And then I think, if it's being done this way, you know, click and it'll take you off out of the book to that site. And that, too, I think for, for some people could be a nice plus. And then the last thing, which I'm really, uh, which I don't think will work for my book, but I'm willing to try it anyway, just to be a guinea pig, is there are one or two places where I, I want to insert a discussion point and actually ask the reader a question. So this is where I had my epiphany, all right? This is, I tell a story in the book about eight years, seven, eight years ago, being at one of Tim O'Reilly's conferences and seeing people all using laptops networked with each other and, and in a back channel chat, right? Like before it was, before Twitter, before all the, you know? And that like blew my mind. And I had this experience then of, oh, this is going to change uh, like the structure of how we do stuff. In, and I'm really curious when everybody else has had that. You know, I think a lot of people have had, at one point or another, that sort of wake up moment. So I thought, let's put a spot in the book where anybody who's reading it can you know, stop and add their comment. And then the next time you upload the book, the comment goes up to the server, and then you know you'll see what other people's comments are. You know, let's make the book a discussion platform. Um, the reason why I'm not sure it's going to work is my guess is is that you know two percent of my readers will do that. So I need like tens of thousands of readers to get a decent number of comments. Um, but I really, I mean, I'm intrigued by the ebook because I think it it is a uh, it can be exploded into something that's much more of a, uh, a shared experience. Um, like Amazon, now you can read your, as you're reading, you'll see sections that have been underlined by other people. It's, I want to know what my friends have underlined. Like, I'll read the same book that you're reading and read your notes. That'll make the book more interesting to me. Um, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I'm glad you know, this sort of gives me a chance to maybe sort of play in that space. So um, we're almost out of time. I, I suppose we should take one more or, yeah. Are you sure it's really a new paradigm? I mean, if you know, a leak from WikiLeaks is like the fuel for the fire, isn't a free press and a society that wants accountability from its government sort of the oxygen that that fire burns in. And so isn't this WikiLeaks stuff just the latest thing, but it's the same as, 
you know, when Woodbridge and Bernstein got the list of all the people who worked for Creep and had to figure out who worked for who by figuring out which phone numbers were closer together, or that, you know, guy that got arrested and, you know, in New Amsterdam, that somebody, Peter something or other John got arrested. John Peter's anger, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, here's what's new. You're right, because it's building on, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of 500 years of a free press or an emerging free press, but only in the last 10 years is it a networked free press. I mean, it used to be said, right, the, the, the freedom of the press belongs to him who can own one. Um, I own one. Um, as long as you don't take the internet down on me, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's different. Um, the ability for small and large groups to swarm around information and keep it in the open is different. The, so, I, I mean, at some point, it's, it goes from being a change uh, in kind and not just a change in degree. I, you know, we could argue it, and it doesn't really matter what, you know, where you come down on that argument. I mean, I think it's an acceleration that we're going through. Um, it may be not discontinuous. Okay, um, but I, the way, you, you know, you guys, you work in, in an environment where you're like completely, you live and eat and breathe this, okay? Um, you know, one of the nice things, I, I always say to myself, I'm glad I, I, you know, there's one piece of my life which is just purely suburban and, you know, I'm with people who are, quote, normal. Um, so I get to see how a lot of this is diffusing into people's lives much more slowly and in very confusing and scary ways. And I do think people need help understanding why this is healthy and not something to just have a knee-jerk fear response to. Um, and also, for younger people, how they can get involved, um, especially younger people. Um, though it would be great if we could get folks with free time called senior citizens more involved in this too. But um, So that's... You know, so some of it maybe is just a marketing ploy to, you know, <laughs> how do you sell ideas? You, you make big claims about them. Uh, it makes it easier for people to spread them. So I do, you know, the age of transparency is one way of making an argument about what's different about now compared to um, 10 years ago. And I, I do think it's different. I mean, it, it used to be that there was lots of information that was technically public but completely hidden in plain sight, right? Like, unless you had the time and money to drive down to Washington, D.C., make an appointment at the FEC or at, uh, you know, uh, uh, the House of Representatives, where you could go into the room to open the paper records that show who is donating to who or how much a particular member of Congress was paying a staffer. I mean, that's public record but difficult to access. Now you can access it in, in a matter of seconds. Uh, and when they hold it back, see, this is what I mean by paradigm shift. Um, the, the argument for holding it back is, is often was, well, we can't afford to make it available in every library in the country. So we're just going to put it in a few. Uh, or you know, you'll have to come make an appointment to look up this information. Like the Justice Department, for example, requires every lobbyist for a foreign country to register and provide very detailed information on the lobbying that they're doing. And it's only because of the Sunlight Foundation, which I, I'm an advisor to, starting to digitize those records so that now you, because they're all written in hand. People don't realize these are paper records filled out in hand. You have to code them in. Uh, that they're starting to move to a system that will make those records digital by default. But the argument in, in this day and age is if something should be, is required to be public, it should be online. They, those things should become uh, uh, synonymous. So at, at Sunlight, we actually have been pushing something called the POIA bill, Public Online Information Act, um, to require that going forward, any document that's generated, that is required to be public, is not sufficiently public until it is also online in searchable and downloadable and machine readable format if, if that's relevant. So we have a lot of work to do. So I'm going to end by saying, you guys, help us out. If you're not already 
uh, you know, supporting Sunlight, for example, get involved. Go to sunlightfoundation.com. They have a, a developer community of more than 2,000 people who pitch in uh, on projects. Um, the other way to get involved is to help explain it. Uh, you know, that's why I wrote this book. Uh, give, give people a tool that sort of put, connects the dots and uh, makes an argument for why this is actually really healthy for our democracy. And let's not let the people who sort of knee-jerk want to go back to controlling information and saying, trust us, we know what's right, you know, to hold sway. Because at the moment, we are, we are in a turning point moment. The WikiLeaks thing is a turning point moment for a lot of people in the, this administration who said they were for open government and now are, you know, kind of silent. And people who want to clamp down on, on information. And there are other bad ideas relating to uh, you know, backdoors into email and stuff like that. There's a lot of bad stuff that these folks still would like to try and do. So we have a fight. Anyway, thank you for coming. We've gone our hour, right? Thank you. Yep. <laughs>